One of the things that I find most fascinating is a phenomenon called swarm intelligence or collective intelligence. This is a, a process whereby groups of animals organize themselves to make good decisions. And we've long known that groups of animals um, can work better than individuals in doing such things as capturing prey and defending themselves. Uh, it's only relatively recently that we've understood that another advantage that groups have over individuals is in their ability to make decisions. And what I've got here is a swarm of bees. This is a swarm of bees that I've mounted on a board. It, by putting them on this board, it just spreads them out so that I can watch their behavior more easily. In nature, they would have clustered on a tree branch. And what they're doing is they're, they've left their parental hive. The parental colony became very strong. The old queen, the mother queen, left with about two thirds of the workers and forms this assembly or bivouac. And uh, they do this because when they leave the parental hive, they actually haven't chosen their new home. So they make this temporary stop here, get their bear, get assembled, figure out who's going to, who's going to go in the swarm, who's going to go back with, to the parental hive. And uh, from here, the scout bees go out searching for home sites and conduct their, their search for a new home, which usually takes at least a few hours and sometimes a few days. This is a, a group of, of, uh, that shows swarm intelligence par excellence because they're a group of bees that are homeless and they have a very important decision to make. They have to decide where their new home is going to be. And they bring to, the, to this task the fact that they've got several, the swarm as a whole has about 10,000 worker bees and one queen bee in it. Of those 10,000 or so bees, only a few hundred are actually involved in the decision making. But still, when you think about it, that's several hundred bees that can go searching far and wide for potential home sites, which would be cavities in trees. And it's several hundred individuals, not just one, that can then debate about, debate the possibilities, kick the ideas around, and decide among themselves through debate which one is actually the best. And I think you can see that, that that's a, a very powerful way to make a decision. If you've got a group of individuals that are cooperative, willing to work together to find, find the options, talk about the options, identify the best one, and then agree to go forward with the, best, the one that's the best choice. So that's what we call swarm intelligence, and it's, I like to investigate it with a real swarm, a swarm of bees. This bee is indicating the direction to her site by the direction of the waggling. This, for example, she's if you imagine a clock face, her, she's orienting, as she walks forward while waggling, she's orienting or pointing at about five o'clock. And that means that, and the reference that she uses to orient, to choose that five o'clock direction is straight up on the swarm. And that means that a bee that's following her dance knows that when she leaves the swarm, she, to find the site she's indicating, she should orient at five o'clock relative to the sun. In other words, the bee would leave the swarm, figure out the direction the sun is of the sun, and then go off, fly off in a direction that would be five o'clock from that direction of the sun. If this site, so for example, if, this, if she were pointing her dance straight down at six o'clock, that would mean the direction to the site is directly away from the sun. If her dance were, if she were doing these waggles, walking straight up on the swarm, that would mean the site that she's advertising is right in the direction of the sun. And then the distance is indicated in the dance by how long each one of these waggle runs lasts. Let's time this, let's roughly time this one. Thousand one, thousand two, thousand three, a little, about three seconds. Thousand one, thousand two, thousand three, 1004, somewhere between three and four seconds. And the conversion is about one second of waggling represents approximately 1,000 meters of distance to the potential home site. So this home site is between 3,000 and 4,000 meters away, and in miles, 
that would be between 1.8 and 2.4 miles away. So quite a, quite a good distance. And one of the things I find most remarkable of all about, about the bees is that the site that she's indicating is, is a hollow tree, a tree with a cavity in it. And it might be one tree, it might be in a forest, so it, it's one tree in the middle of a, in the middle of a woods. And it's at a certain direction from here. It's several miles away. And these other bees that are following her dance are actually able to take those instructions with sufficient accuracy, sufficient precision, and go out and, and find the site that she's, lo that she's advertising. Isn't that amazing? I find it so. I don't, I don't think I could do that. I could, I could read her dance. I could measure her angle quite precisely and I could f get the distance information precisely, but could I then use it and find the tree? With o only with great difficulty. One of the, f one of the features of the decision-making by the bees is that they, uh, the, whole, the process is built upon disagreement. It starts with, of these several hundred scout bees, they'll, each one will fly out, search around. They will uh, typically, among them, they'll find a dozen or more potential home sites and they, those, that, those bees that find potential home sites will come back and advertise them with dances. So you can have on the swarm at any one time a dozen or more different sites being advertised by the dances. And so they then have the problem of how to sort it out, how to winnow out all but the, uh, all but the best one. And they have, a very, they have a process that's a lot like a political election. You think about it, you've got in a human political election, a de democratic election, you've got multiple candidates, you've got supporters for the different candidates, the supporters for the different candidates produce advertisements, uh, to try to recruit the uncommitted voters to favor their candidate. The scout bees do essentially the same sort of thing. You've got bees that are affiliated with different sites, they perform advertisements to draw uncommitted scouts to their site, and uh, one thing that's critical about the way it works in the bees is that the, their advertisements are all completely honest. And what I mean by that is that if the site is, they adjust how long they will dance, whether it's one minute or 10 minutes or 20 minutes, a scout bee will adjust how long she advertises her site according to the goodness of the site. The better the site, the longer the dance. And what that means is that an excellent site will be advertised more persistently. It will, uh, the buildup of uh, interest in that site will proceed most rapidly. And in the, in the bees political contest, it, they run the contest until one of the sites, until one of these candidate sites reach, has gained an, enough or a critical level of interest, a critical level of visits by scout bees. And once that site has has achieved that, the bees visiting that site recognize that, oh yeah, our site has reached the quorum, the critical level, our site is won, and then they come back and they announce to all of the other bees that the debate is over, they can proceed now to implementing their decision. So that's how it works with the bees, and except for that last little part at the end, by using a, a quorum rather than a majority rule, the way they make their decision and deal with disagreement is, is very much like our own political elections. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that amazing? <laughs>
The Wisdom of the Hive, 1995, Harvard University Press, and Honey Bee Democracy, 2010, Princeton University Press. And you've seen copies of the book out there in the atrium. So he's going to talk to us today on Honey Bee Democracy. Tom, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to our podium. Well, thank you very much, folks, for coming out today. Um, I hope you will enjoy this, this talk. It's about honeybee democracy. Bill, part of the reason for me it's a pleasure to be here is that this is a story of scientific discovery that was conducted here at Cornell. As Howie said, it's, uh, I started out working with um, Professor Roger Morse in the entomology department, and the story stretches back to the early 1970s at, out at Dice Laboratory. It then moved on to uh, being involved with Jack Kingsbury at the Shoals Marine Laboratory, and we'll see some slides of that as well today. Um, so it's a, it's a pleasure to share this story with you, and um, I know many of you probably have served in administrative roles, been department chairs and so forth. Um, I'll, I'll mention at the outset that I, a number of the things that emerge from this story about how bees work together to make a decision, in their case it's a life or death decision, a lot of their methods I applied to our own department, our phone faculty meetings, and uh, I think the reputation, of course, is that a department faculty meeting can be like a hornet's nest, and I, I hope, Howie, that I made ours a little bit more like a beehive. <laughs> so uh, I'll share with you how that worked towards the end of the talk, some of the things that I learned. Um, you might be wondering, why democracy? Why this term democracy? Well, we all know that democracy is a form of government where the power is vested in the people, really in the people, um, not in, not in the, uh, some uh, king or other leader. But with a bee colony, everybody knows that a honeybee colony has a queen bee in it. So why isn't it a honeybee monarchy? Well, the, there is a queen, but she's not a ruler of a colony, of a bee colony. She's just the mother of it. She lays the eggs. She's the genetic heart of the colony, but she's not a royal decider. She doesn't know, for example, when the colony should produce more comb or whether it should make more brood or where the foragers should be deployed each day. These are, these are all decisions that are made by the workers, and they make these decisions collectively. And what we're going to be looking at is one of these democratic decisions made by the bees about where, they, where their home will be. Uh, we all know that democracy is not perfect. There's a famous Winston Churchill quote here. Um, the idea, his quote expresses the idea that it's the best of, of bad options. And Maybe that's true, but I think one of the things I've learned from the bees is that in the right, if it's done in the right way, in the right circumstances, democracy is not just making the best of a bad situation, it can be making the best of a good situation. And that's not just my idea. There was a gentleman, James Sirowicki, that name may be familiar to some of you. He writes the financial page in The New Yorker. He wrote this nice book a few years ago called The Wisdom of Crowds. And his main point was that with the right organization, democratic groups are remarkably intelligent, often smarter than the smartest individual in them. Why is that? It's because a democratic group with the right organization can take advantage of the knowledge of the members and can winnow through the possibilities and, and identify the best one. And that's exactly what the bees have to do when they're choosing a home. Uh, so we're going to be looking at this case of democratic decision making um, by scout bees in a swarm. And uh, at the end, as I mentioned at the end of the talk, I'll share with you some of what I like to call swarm smarts, things that I've learned from, from the bees and have used. Now, what it, what is, where, we, where in the bee biology are we going? Well, we're going, we're going to be looking at this thing over here on the left. It's a swarm of bees contains one queen bee and about 10,000 worker bees. It's a reproductive propagule of a colony. In the spring or early summer, a colony outgrows its hive. It's strong enough that it can fission and to set out to create a new colony. So the old queen leaves with about 10,000 worker bees. They fly out of the hive in a swarm. It only takes a few minutes, but they don't go straight to their new home. In fact, they haven't chosen their new home. Instead, they first they form this bivouac, this cluster on a tree branch, and they're going to here they will make the choice of where their new home is going to be. And they'll be hanging here for a day or two. 
Now, how do they, so clearly they're homeless. How do they go about finding a home? Well, they do as, uh, maybe at a university you might expect them to do, they uh, form a committee. They form a search committee, and it's a pretty big search committee. It's a couple hundred bees, scout bees. And these are among, these scouts are among the oldest, most experienced bees in the swarm. These are the bees that have had the most experience flying out from the hive when they were foragers. They flew out of the hive, flew out for miles out to patches of flowers, and have a lot of experience finding their way back home. They're going to have to do the same thing here. They're going to be flying out for miles looking for tree cavities, the right hollows in the right trees, and then coming back to the swarm. And uh, so that's what, they're, that's what they're going to do. So they start out, these scouts, these eldest, most experienced bees, they fly out, fan out, they will search independently. So they're going to fan out across the countryside, and then they're going to be searching for potential homes. What are they looking for? Well, here's, this slide shows what is a, a, I like it because it's, it shows a dream home for honeybees. It's, uh, this was a sugar maple that was up in the hills of Caroline uh, before, it, uh, before I studied it. Bees were living in a hollow in the tree here, accessed through this knot hole. And what made it a dream home was um, several properties, the most important ones I've listed here. The entrance was high off the ground, which makes it safe from predators like mice and uh, raccoons, and, and these days, bears. They're just not uh, e easily found by predators this high. They like the entrance to be small, only a few square inches in area. This, uh, this is very important, again, keeping predators out. It makes an easily defended location of the nest. And it, in the winter time, when the bees are keeping warm inside their nest, it means there's not a lot of air, cold air blowing into the nest. Another feature of this, of this tree cavity, and this is this, this log here, is this section of the tree split open, exposing the nest. It's quite spacious. This has about 10 gallons of space, or 40 liters, and the, that, the bees need that. They need that much space because honeybees survive the winter not by letting their bodies cool down like all other insects do. They fight the cold. They form a cluster inside their nest, and they, uh, they can generate it's a well-insulated cluster about the size of a soccer ball, and they will be producing heat in that ball all winter long. It's like there's a little 40-watt light bulb burning inside the nest all winter long, and because the cluster is well-insulated, they can uh, survive. In fact, they keep the temperature about 95 degrees Fahrenheit in the core of that cluster. It's amazing, but it's expensive, and they, they burn through about 40 pounds of honey. That's their winter heating fuel. So they need a lot of space inside that cavity, in uh, nest cavity, um, for them to survive. And the last thing I've listed here is they like these nests to be in a sturdy, live tree so the thing doesn't blow down. Now, when you think about it, this is probably not an easy combination of traits to find. You've got to find a live tree that has a big, rotted space inside it. That large space is accessed just through a little opening. And to top it all off, that opening is high off the ground. And this is, this is not, there are not a lot of cavities that fulfill those requirements. And that's probably why a swarm allocates several hundred bees to going, scout bees, going out searching for possibilities. So we've got these several hundred bees that have gone out. And if you watch in the woods in the spring, you might see a honeybee going up and down tree, a scout bee going up and down trees, looking for crevices, dark openings, things like that. If a bee finds one, what does it do? Well, it first makes a private evaluation of the site. It'll spend about 45 minutes at the site, making visit after visit inside the tree cavity. This is a diagram that shows the movements of, of a scout bee that discovered one of my experimental nest boxes, and I tracked her movements. And I'll just show representation of movements for four of the 25 visits she made. You can see that initially, she came in, walked around, and then quickly came back to the entrance. Next visit, she walked more deeply into the cavity, or visit eight, that is. Visit 17, by that 17th visit, she's moving all around inside the cavity. Her last visit, she's roaming throughout the cavity quite extensively. And in ways that aren't entirely clear, she's acquiring information about the properties of that site. She's measuring its volume, the size of the entrance, the uh, distance of the entrance off the ground, and so forth. The one thing we do know is that if you make a bee walk, if you, if you make an experimental nest cavity where the bee has to 
it basically puts the bee on a treadmill, a rotating cylinder, and you make her walk more or you make her walk less, she has the impression the cavity is either large, very large, or very small. So we know there's something about that walking that is involved in measuring the volume of the cavity. But so she measures all of those things over this approximately 45 minute period, and she's been working entirely on her own because she, the only one bee finds a site at a time. And then she comes back to the swarm and she will now make a public, public report at the swarm of what she's found. And this is a remarkable thing. These, little, these are little insects, and yet they, on the side of the swarm, on the vertical surface of the swarm, the bee will do a dance. I'll show you a movie of it momentarily. And in doing this dance, she shares with the other scouts, the ones that did not happen to find a possible home site, information about the direction and the distance and the goodness of what she found. Let's look at what this dance looks like. We're going to, this is a, this is what the surface of a swarm looks like. You're going to see that most of the bees on, in the, uh, in the image here are sitting quietly. That's the, those are all the non-scouts. They're sitting quietly, conserving the honey that they've, all the bees, when they left their hive, they left with a stomach full of honey, stuffed with honey. They're conserving that honey supply. The only, the, only the scout bees will be running around on the surface. So we'll see one bee dancing, advertising a home site, and we'll see other scout bees tripping along behind her, getting the information. Okay, here's our scout, waggling, waggling. Note she's quite consistent in the direction her body points. She's pointing to the left every time she does that waggling. And she's very consistent in how long each one of those waggle phases lasts. It's about two seconds, 1,001, 1,002, 1,001, 1,002. And you'll see the other bees tagging along behind her. So she is a, that is a scout bee that found something. And she's at sharing that news with her, with her fellow scouts. Now, how does the information expressed in the dance? Well, this was worked out by a, a German scientist, Carl von Frisch, in 1946, working at the University of Munich, right at the end of World War II. What he discovered, and it was a, it was a discovery that really shook up our view of animal behavior, that something as, a, a creature as simple as a bee could do this. But the bee, he was studying it in the context of bees advertising food sources, patches of flowers. And what he discovered is that to indicate the direction to the flowers, the direction to fly from a home out to the flowers, the bee takes note of the angle to the flight to the flowers relative to the direction of the sun, or technically the sun's azimuth. In this case, the, so the flowers are 40 degrees to the right of the uh, sun's azimuth, sun's direction. That means that when she gets back to the nest and performs a dance on the vertical comb, she copies that angle. She, where she does her waggles, back and forth, back and forth, moving forward, she does that at 40, the same angle, 40 degrees to the right of straight up on the comb. So outside the hive, the sun is the reference direction. Inside the hive, straight up is the reference direction. And she codes the distance. As it's indicated by the duration of each waggle run. So the, the greater the distance to the flowers, the food source, the longer the, each waggle run lasts. They can last from a fraction of a second to several seconds. And so the other bees that are following the dancer, they can measure that angle, they can measure the duration of the waggle runs, and they can fly out and uh, find these food sources. Now, von Frisch always studied it in the context of foraging. And it was one of his students, Martin Lindauer, who discovered, who really made the discovery that bees are quite versatile in the use of this waggle dance. They use it not just to advertise food sources, they also use it to advertise home sites, nest sites. And Lindauer made this discovery in 1949. He was coming, he was studying with Carl von Frisch. He came out of the Zoological Institute at Munich one day afternoon in the spring, and he saw a swarm of bees, like this one here, um, hanging in a bush near the front door of the institute. They had hives of bees for their bee work at the institute, and one of them swarmed. Lindauer looked at the swarm, uh, and he noticed bees dancing on the surface of the swarm. And he at first thought, oh, those must be bees that have gone out, found food, and are bringing still more food to the swarm, so everybody would be even uh, thoroughly f um, loaded with food. But Lindauer is a very good observer, and he noticed a couple of things that didn't seem quite right. One is that he noticed that the bees, 
doing the dances, never unloaded any food to other bees. He also noticed that a lot of the bees were kind of dirty. Some of the bees looked like they had red brick dust on them or dirt. Some even looked like they had soot on them. And he told me that he, you can pluck a bee, you grab a bee by its wings. He told me he plucked one of these, one of these sooty looking bees off, off the surface of the swarm, one of these dancing sooty bees, and he sniffed it. And he said it smelled like a chimney sweep. And that was his very good indication to him that this bee was definitely not coming back from a patch of flowers, but had been poking around in a chimney somewhere. Now, why? What's, what's going on? Why a chimney? Well, you have to, under, have to remember, 1949, Munich. Munich was, was and still is an industrial city. It was heavily bombed during the Second World War um, from bombers coming up from Italy. And uh, at the time, there was a great deal of rubble. Uh, Lindauer said that as a student, one of the jobs they had to do was just spend an hour a day cleaning rubble um, in the city. What these bees were doing, these house hunting scout bees were doing, is they were going out in the city, they were finding cracks in walls, broken chimneys, and so forth, had discovered those as potential home sites, and were coming back and reporting on them. But Lindner wasn't didn't leave it just there. He, he said, okay, I want to learn more about this. I want to really be sure that these bees are nest site scouts. So what did he do? He realized that he knew how to read a dance of a scout bee on a swarm, assuming it was a scout bee. And by timing the dance and the, uh, measuring the angle of the dance and so forth, he could determine for each dancing scout bee the location in the city that she was advertising. And he did this, and he, uh, he, got, he followed more swarms. He followed the dancers on swarms. And he found he made some very interesting observations. He discovered that initially, the bees performing the dances on, on a swarm the different bees will be advertising different sites, multiple sites around the city. But that before the swarm flies away, to move to, once to before it flies away to its new home, all of the dances are indicating just one location. And he was able to determine, in addition, that the swarm flies to this dance consensus site and moves in. Now, how did he know that? Well, when, the swarm, when a swarm of bees takes off, it's a ball of bees about this big. It'll launch into flight. It'll explode into flight once the decision has been made. It only takes about 60 seconds. But then they stay fairly tight. They, a swarm of, cloud of a swarm would fill about maybe a third of this open area in the front of the uh, auditorium here. And it doesn't fly very high. The, the bottom of this cloud of bees is, is right above my head height, so about two or three meters up. And it only flies about maximum about six miles per hour. And so Lindauer could run along beneath the swarm when it was flying away, and he could track them to the, to some of them, to their new homes. For example, here's a map of the downtown Munich where the main train station is. The Zoological Institute was one block away. Here's where the swarms were taking off. And the first one he tracked one, two, three, four, four and a half blocks to the north and found that the swarm, which was the site that the dances were consistent for right before the swarm took off, and the swarm moved into a broken wall there. And so he could conclude from that that these dances on the swarm really do indicate possible home sites. And he, made, he had the very good insight. He didn't quite say it in terms of democracy. He said it was a plebiscite. The scout bees conduct a plebiscite to choose their new home. Um, but that's where the story ended. And he, did, he finished, it, finished his work in 1954, published it in his uh, Habilitation Schrift in 1955. And that's where the story lay quiet and, uh, until I, I picked it up in the early 70s. Didn't make great progress on it then. Picked it up in the late 90s and took it forward from there. Now, why did the story sit quietly for, for many years? Uh, Everybody wanted to know, how does democracy work in a honeybee swarm? Clearly, there was something interesting going on here. These bees go out, find things, come back, report on them. It looks like they have a kind of debate, come to an agreement. How does that all work? And the reason Lindauer couldn't investigate it more thoroughly is he explained to me the tools he had at the time were, were very simple. This was 
short, this was in the late 40s, early 50s, the German economy was just starting to rebuild itself. Here are the tools he had. He had a chair, he had a notebook, he had a pencil, he had a little paint set for labeling the, some of the bees. Um, did I say notebook? Yeah, he had a notebook. He had a wristwatch and he had a stopwatch. That's what he had. So, so he could only watch one bee at a time. He could only read one dance at a time. He couldn't get a synoptic view of the whole process. That had to wait until the advent of video recording technology. And even the video recording technology wasn't really good enough until the late 80s and early 90s. So I picked up on this project um, with video technology and basically started uh, my start of my work where Lindauer left off. And that is to say, I started by making a detailed eavesdropping on the scalp bees' activities on a swarm. And when I say detailed, I mean, I mean detailed. I really wanted to know everything that was going on by each individual. And I wanted to know what, I wanted to know at the level of what individual, different individuals were doing. To do this, I have to make swarms where every bee in the swarm is labeled for individual identification. This is a matter of gluing a little, um, it's like a little license plate, a little tag on the back of the thorax of the bee, and then putting a paint, color paint mark on the uh, abdomen. I've got 500 different tags, color and number combinations of 500 combinations of tags. I've got lots of different paint colors for the abdomen. So I could make swarms with 4,000 bees labeled for individual identification. And a lot of times people ask me, how long does it actually take to label 4,000 bees? And I have to say, it only takes about a day if you get three or four hardworking Cornell undergraduates to help you. Because <laughs> then you can make an assembly line where everybody does their part of the process. And uh, I tell the students, this is going to be a thought, this is going to be thoughtful work. <laughs> I don't explain to them that that means that they're going to have a lot of time to think while they're <laughs> doing this work. So make a swarm with all 4,000 bees labeled in it. And of course, has a queen bee in it as well. And then we can take a swarm, one of these swarms, and the worker bees, the labeled worker bees, will cluster wherever the queen bee is. And so we always put the queen bee in a little cage. So we put the queen bee on this swarm stand here with some feeder bottles to keep the bees well fed. The <coughs> workers will cluster on this flat board and they'll even, um, and so we've got a nice flat surface on which the scout bees will do their dances. The scouts always do their dances on the outside surface of the swarm. That's very convenient. And then with a video camera you can record every dance, you know the time, you can transcribe from the video recordings, the dance angle, the dance duration, and so forth. And you can record who did the dance. And what I want to share with you now, this is the most important slide in the talk, is a record of one of these debates by scout bees. Is a, this unfolded over three days, 16 hours, which is typical for choosing a home. They take their time. It's a, they, in this particular debate, 11 possible home sites were considered and 149 scout bees were involved in the discussion. Um, and uh, I, I want to um, remind us at the outset, this is a process, we're going to look at a process This is being done by insects, not people. This diagram might look like something people would generate, but it's done by, it's produced by insects. Well, let's go through this. Each of the, in this diagram, there are these eight panels. Each panel records the pattern of dancing done during a two-hour time period. So this first one is the first day of the 20th of July from 11 to 1 p.m. This, this um, pattern of dancing was observed. Now each of the circle in the center represents the swarm. Each arrow represents a record of bees performing dances for a certain location, for a certain site. This pink arrow indicates dancing was done for a site to the east, as indicated by the arrow's direction. Uh, the length of the arrow indicates the distance to the site. So it was about two kilometers or about one and a quarter miles away. And the width of the arrow indicates how many different scout bees during the two hour time period performed a dance advocating that site. So here's our scale of number of bees down here. About 10 bees during that first two hours danced for this site two kilometers to the east. And in addition, there were other sites, one to the south, southeast, South, uh, another CLT site, southwest site, north site. So six different sites were, had been discovered by scalpies and were reported 
by them during the first two hour time period. And clearly no agreement at that point. Second two hour time period, one to three in the afternoon. Again, various sites were being advertised by dancing scout bees. All different directions, different distances. Third two hour time period, three to five p.m., getting to the end of the day, end of the afternoon. Various sites are being advertised still. Here's the last record of dancing that first day, 5 to 7 p.m. A variety of sites are being advertised, but just two of them are getting a lot of attention. The site to the <coughs> south and the site to the southwest. And that's where the dancing ended that day. Clearly they hadn't reached an agreement, but it looked like those two sites were starting to <coughs> gain a lead in the debate. The next morning, we arrived, we got our equipment set up early so we could catch the first dancing. Uh, the bees only started dancing around uh, a little after seven, so we got all the dances. And again, they picked up where they left off the previous day, with site to the south and the southwest being the most popular. And that process <coughs> continued during the morning, and the site to the southwest, as you can see, started to gain a lead over the site to the south. Got a strong lead by the end of the morning. Almost all of the bees were dancing for the southwest site. But then it started raining at the very end of the morning. Rained all afternoon and the process ended at 11.54 for that day. Um, that night, it rained, continued to rain, but in the morning, it was no longer raining, and by nine o'clock, the bees were dancing again, and as you can see, all of now every scout bee that did a dance that next morning danced for the site to the southwest. And at the end of the morning, the swarm at 11.58, the swarm took off and flew to the direction to the southwest, to, its, to that consensus site. Now, the reason I emphasize this slide is it shows the overall pattern. You can see that these scouts have gone out, they've found various options, they've put the options on the table, there were 11 different options, and then somehow they winnow out all of the options except for one. Only one is being advertised at the end. And, uh, it's a remarkable process. I, it, still, it still amazes me that insects can conduct such a well-organized discussion and come to an agreement. But it, what's even more remarkable is the agreement, the consensus site, is the best site. It's the best site. So they're not just making a choice. They're not just building an agreement, but they're making a good choice. Now, how do I know it's a good decision? Well, I know it because I was able to take advantage of the um, Shoals Marine Laboratory's very special location on the island, on Appledore Island off the coast of Maine. This is, uh, how, how many of you have been to this island? Yeah, oh wow, okay, great. So you know that this is an island that's north of Boston, it's about six miles out, so it's far enough from the mainland that bees, if I took a swarm of bees out to the island, they can't fly back to the mainland and get back to the trees out there, uh, back to the mainland. And the feature of this island is that it, um, though it has strong winds, which are not good for bee work, it has poison ivy, which is not good for bee researchers, and likewise the seagulls, it has no trees on the island, or no large trees, no large trees with large cavities in them. So that means I could bring a swarm of bees out to the island, I could put out nest boxes on the island, and the poor bees were then were stuck. They had to choose among the options I gave them. And I was basically giving them a multiple choice test. I would take a swarm, here's one of these swarms mounted on the swarm mount, and it's, put it on, it's mounted on the porch of the uh, old Coast Guard building on the island. These orange boards are windbreaks. Put the swarm at the center of the island, and then I put out, I'm going to put out five nest boxes, so it really is a multiple choice problem. Five nest boxes, and only one is the right answer. <laughs> one of them is going to be an excellent home site, and the other four are going to be wrong. <laughs> going to be not great home sites. They're going to be okay, but they're not as good as the, as the really good one. Now, how do I vary the quality? And I, so the question is, could a, would, could, I could do this experiment over and over. And the question was, could swarms consistently choose the good site, the correct answer? And you might wonder, well, how do you vary the quality of the nest boxes? Well, it goes back to those properties I talked about earlier that matter to the bees. Uh, volume, entrance size, and so forth. For this experiment, I just, I, I had everything right in the nest boxes, everything the bees liked, except they were low to the ground. And some of the nest boxes were set at 
15 liters of space. The bees like 40 liters. The si if I take out this inner wall, they get all of the 40 liters space in the box. But if I put a wall in at this point, they only have 15 liters of nesting space. And that makes it less than ideal. So the choice is going to be four boxes are going to be set at 15 liters. One's going to be set at 40 liters. And the question is, can the bees choose the good, the good box? And here's what these boxes actually look like set up. Each one's in a little little hut to protect it from the wind and the sun and so forth. And I won't go through this in detail, but this is an example of what we would find that the bees would do. Here's the first trial. There's five boxes, one, two, three, four, five. One of them, way at the end of the array, was, set, was given the excellent, was the 40 liter box. The other f uh, four boxes were set at 15 liters. And here we have time of day on the horizontal. Number of scout bees visible at the nest box just buzzing around the entrance at each box is on the vertical axis. And you can see that they actually discovered the four mediocre sites a little after 8 o'clock in the morning. They discovered all, f all four of them. Um, and they started building up interest at these boxes. Scout bees were checking them out. They didn't discover the excellent box till uh, a little after noon. And, uh, but once they discovered the excellent box, the number of scout bees at that box built up strongly. And by the end of the afternoon, the bees had chosen that box and took off and tried to move to that box. I, I don't let the swarm, in these experiments, I don't let the swarm actually move to the new home. I keep the queen cage, so they, they take off, they try to move to the home, they discover they don't have their queen, they come back to the swarm mount, and that makes it easy for me to take down the swarm and do another trial. I would, so I could, this swarm made the right decision, they chose the right box. Next swarm did the same sort of thing, it found two, found two of the mediocre boxes, um, uh, and got interested in those two. And then finally it found the excellent box and then that one prevailed. The strongest number of scout bees built up at that box and they took off and tried to move to it as well. And we've done this experiment, uh, get, it's over 10 times now and we found they made a mistake just once. So they get, they're about 95% accurate in their, in their decision making. And the one time they messed up was a time when they, um, the box that was the excellent box um, was discovered just so late in the process that these couldn't, couldn't, they had such a strong buildup of interest in one of the mediocre boxes, they couldn't, they couldn't quite recover from that uh, problem. Now, one thing I want to explain is, uh, I want to share with you a little bit of the f a feel for what it's like to do these experiments. What I've shown you so far, it might, you might get the sense that it's like clockwork. You set up a swarm on the island, you put out your boxes, the swarm, the scouts go out, they find the boxes, and they choose. Well, it actually doesn't, didn't, didn't initially at least, didn't work quite that smoothly. I, uh, this is a shot back at the beginning of some of this experimental work. I had my nest box set up, had nice, set it up by this little bit of ledge, so I had a nice little bench there. I could sit and wait for the scout bees. I set up my swarm, I set up my nest boxes, I went down to the nest boxes to wait for scout bees to arrive, and I waited and I waited for an hour or more, a couple of hours actually, and no scout bees came. And I was going from box to box thinking, well, they'll find this one or find this one. Finally, I decided, no, I, this nothing, something's not going right here. What, and so I went back to the swarm because I knew that if the scouts had found something, they would be doing dances for it on the swarm. And um, so I'm wondering, where are these bees? I go back to the swarm. I immediately see that the bees are, their scout bees are dancing excitedly. But their, their dances, I quickly read the dances. The dances are not pointing towards my array. They're pointing over here to this particular building. And I have, to sh I have to tell you folks, this was not good news. Why was this bad news? It was because when I had come to the island a few days before, this was when I was starting to work, Jack Kingsbury told me, Tom, you can work all over this island, wherever you want, except you can't go, you can't go over here. These are private dwellings and we want to respect their privacy. But most importantly, don't go to that house. Because that's, and what was that house? Well, that was the house of Rodney Sullivan. He was a reclusive lobster fisherman, very much valued his privacy and enforced it with a loaded shotgun behind his door. And he was known to uh, shoot it off over the heads of students if they got too close to his house. Well, where were my scout bees going? They were going into his chimney. I didn't know that at first. All I knew was that the bees are going into Rodney Sullivan's house or someplace near it. So I go to Jack and Jack Kingsbury and say, Jack, what are we going to do? And Jack says, well, we can't go, 
we can't just walk over to his house because he'll think we're sneaking up on him if we come up from behind. We've got to go by boat. So we get in, we get a boat, go over, call up to his, Rodney's house, hoping he's home. We uh, call up and say, hey, in, 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 Rodney, are you home? And he said, yeah, I'm home. Can we come up? Yeah, come on up. I got a problem. I got bees. <laughs> and so, and he, was, he was quite terrified by these bees. He had, he had never seen anything like this before, because at this point, there were, the site was very popular among the scouts. There were probably 100 scout bees buzzing around the top of his chimney, flying around his house. Uh, and he had wondered whether they had been blown out by a storm or whatnot. And uh, I don't think I quite revealed to him that I'd brought the bees out, <laughs> but I did say, well, just by chance, I can help you with this. Uh, the, the solution was simple. He had a ladder, he had some old screen, and he had some duct tape. So I built a fire in his wood stove, which is what the chimney was for, and uh, made a fire, smoked the scout bees out, put a uh, taped screen over the top of the chimney, and that prevented the scouts from getting getting back in. So at this point, the island was pretty well, the alternatives to the nest boxes were pretty well eliminated, and the scout bees then went on to do the experiment that I described. So we've seen that a swarm as a whole is able to bring in information about possible home sites, work through a decision, and then eventually, once they've reached agreement, they will move on to their new home. But how do they actually do this? What actually happens among the scout bees at the individual level? Well, there's two, there's two phenomena we really would like to understand here. One is we've seen that the bees' interest grows and grows for the best site. It's, this is the winning, the best site. Started out on day one. It only had 13% of the dancing here. It garnered 33% of the dance activity here at the end of the first day. Middle of the second day, it had risen to 62% of the attention. And of course, the morning of the, the final day, it, gained a, it had 100% of the attention of the scout bees. How did that happen? Why did it grow and grow? And the other thing is, somehow the bees, the scout bees' interest faded for all the poorer sites. How did that happen? All these bees that were so excited about the, these other sites, especially these bees advertising the, blue, the site with a blue arrow to the south, Somehow, by the end, they stopped their dancing. Well, how did that happen? And I think we all know when we have discussions, it's often one of the more difficult things is getting somebody to give up on a, a losing idea. <laughs> but with the scalpies, it works. The uh, they, uh, interest faded for the poor sites. How did that happen? Well, let's start with the first question. Well, one way to think of this, and it, it's, it is an accurate way to do it, is to think of that the scout bees' decision-making process is like a democratic election. That is to say, you've got, you've got different sites, different candidate sites. You've got supporters for each of these sites, the scouts that are supporting site A, for example, or the scouts supporting site B. And they produce ads, i.e. these waggle dances, to try to recruit uncommitted individuals, uncommitted scout bees, from this pool here of being uncommitted over to being a supporter for site A or site B. And uh, of course, there's apath apathy can set into scout bees, as we'll see. And so they can drop out of being a supporter for one of the sites and go back into the pool of uncommitted scouts. So you've got this competition among the supporters for different candidates, different candidate sites, for individuals that are not yet committed. So that's like a democratic election. Now, so it's a competition. Now, one feature of honeybee elections, which is maybe a little curious or different, is that there's, turns out there's completely honest advertising of the candidates. That's a key feature of why they make good decisions. What do I mean by honest advertising? I mean that a site, site A, for example, will be get strong advertisements, that is to say strongly, strong dancing by the scout bees for that site, it will only get strong ads if it's a really good site. And likewise, if, a site, if this site isn't as good, it will, it will get only weak ads, weaker ads. So the bees are honestly adjusting the strength of their advocacy of a site based on the goodness of the site. And I think you can see that that's going to help the best site win in this election process. Now, how do I know and what do, exactly do I mean by um, honest ad advertising? 
How do we know that they honestly advertise their sites? Well, I went, to do this, I went back to Appledore, would put up a swarm or two, and uh, one swarm at a time, put up two nest boxes, now just two nest boxes. One's going to be excellent, one's going to be mediocre. And I'm going to have, in this situation, I'm going to have scout bees coming back from two sites, two, two sites, back to the same swarm at the same time, under the same weather conditions. Everything's the same except that one group, bunch of scouts is coming back from an excellent site, one's coming back from a mediocre site, and I'm going to watch closely at how those bees dance differently. And in particular, what I wanted to do is I needed to count how many of these dance circuits a bee does, depending on the goodness of her sight. A dance circuit is, consists of a, a waggle phase, and then the bee stops waggling, comes back around, does another waggle, comes around the other way. Each one of these things of a waggle phase combined with the return is what we call one dance circuit. And the question is, do bees coming back from better sites do more of these dance circuits than bees coming back from mediocre sites? And why were we interested in that? It's because we knew from studies of foraging that if a bee does more dance circuits, she, has, she creates more opportunities for bees to get her message, and so she gets more recruits. So we, that's why we were looking at the number of dance circuits performed. And how do you actually, what does it actually look like? Well, here we've got, this is the nest boxes. So we'd have one helper stationed at a nest box. This was the fixer upper site, the 15 liter. Over here is the dream home, another person there. Um, we didn't, in this particular experiment, we didn't have to label all of the scout bees in the swarm. We just had to label the individuals that were scouting our two nest boxes. Um, and the way we did that is when a scout bee would come to a nest box, discover a nest box, we just put an insect net over the entrance of the nest box. So when the scout bee came out after her first visit, we could catch her in the, in the folds of the insect net and put a paint mark on her. And remarkably, the bees are not disturbed by this handling. We handle them gently, but even so, we thought they'd be disturbed, but no. You let the bee out of the insect net, what does she do? She takes off and just goes back in the box. It's kind of abduction by aliens. And as we all know, if, when you're abducted by aliens, you have no disturbance, no memory even of it. So, so this honest advertising, this is what I mean. The bees from if they come back from a dream home, these are the distribution numbers of bees doing different numbers of dance circuits. And if they come back from the dream home, most of the bees will do more than 100. Many of the bees will do more than 100 dance circuits to advertise that site. And on average, they do about 90. If they come back from the fixer-upper, most of them do less than 100, and the average is only about 30. So the higher a bee judges a site's quality, the longer she dances. And this biases things in favor of the better site. And curiously, in, the scouts don't compare sites. Each scout just goes to one site, checks it out, and then comes back and reports on it, which tells us that these bees know innately what makes a good home. It's like they go to a site, check its volume, entrance size, entrance height, and so forth, and then give it a, give it a ranking, say on a scale of 1 to 10, and then they adjust their dancing accordingly to that ranking. It's, it's it's, to me, as I say, it's, it's stunning that an this is all being done by a little insect. So the best candidate becomes the mo most popular through this honest and accurate campaigning. And this, I show it schematically here. Let's say it's a simplest situation of choosing between two sites. One on the right here is the better site by virtue of a smaller entrance opening. Let's say both sites are discovered exactly the same time. So you have a scout bee coming back from this site and this site both exactly at 10 a.m. in the morning. But the site for the bee coming back from this site, represented by this blue dancer here, let's say she does 90 dance circuits, whereas the bee from the poorer site only does 30 dance circuits to advertise her site. Well, if you came back three hours later, you're going to have three times as many bees at this site now, because the dance was three times as strong. So you got more bees at the better site, and you have more dancers at the better site. And now, the process is going to snowball in favor of the better site, because each of these blue bees is, is still dancing three times as strong as the red bee. Moreover, now there are three times as many blue bees as the red bees. So it's a case of the, the kind of the rich getting richer, or positive feedback, which carries it, if you came back three hours later, almost everybody is dancing for this 
better site to the right, and there's a lot of these at this site. So this is how they can build an agreement. At least it's part of the story. But how does a, how did, so we've talked about it as an election. How does a site, site A or site B, how does a site actually win an election in this contest? Well, one possibility is what we had, we thought this for many years was that the consensus cho choice, the site that becomes the consensus uh, of the dancing bees on the swarm was the winning site. But one thing that made us wonder about that is we, for that to work, it would imply that the scout bees are walking around on the surface of the swarm polling the dancers to know whether a site has become the uh, agreed upon site or not. And we never actually saw scout bees polling the, the dancers. So it cast doubt on that idea. The other possibility was that maybe what really matters is a site wins if it gains enough popularity in the sense of enough bees build up at the site. A quorum of bees, of scout bees, builds up at the site. You see, I should explain that a scout bee finds a site, checks it out, comes back and dances on the swarm, and then she goes back to the site. In a sense, a bee votes for, you could think of a bee voting for a site both by doing a dance for the site, but also by going to the site and spending time at the site. And it turns out, well, just to exemplify these, what these alternatives are, the question is, are the bees paying attention to this buildup of consensus at the swarm, or are they paying attention to the buildup of bees at the winning site? And it turns out the answer is, it's this. Reaching a quorum is, is how the scouts know that one site has won the contest. I won't go through the experimental details of that, but you know, that's a curious thing. They use a quorum, and so you can think of it as a bee voting in favor of her site by going back to the site and spending time there. And uh, the more dances there are for the site, the more bees that will be spending time at the site. So that's a curious thing. They use a quorum system. It's like people voting, not by raising their hands, but by saying, I vote for that option by going and standing on that side of the room or, or this side of the room. I probably, we probably should have known this way back when we were doing the multiple choice experiments because we did see that every time the number of scout bees visible at, outside the nest box built up to about 15, the swarm would then make preparations to take off and move to that site, here, here, and, and the other. So we don't know how the bees sense a quorum, but we do know that they're paying attention to that buildup at the site. I, there is this second question. I don't think, I won't go through it in great detail. Bees' interest fades for all the poorer sites. How does that happen? Well, in a nutshell, what happens is that bees have a built-in sense. There's two parts to the answer to that. One is the bees have a built-in sense of knowing that they shouldn't persistently dance for a site. In fact, they shouldn't even persistently keep visiting the site. So a scout bee typically um, either discovers a site or gets recruited to a site. She'll check it out. She'll come back to the swarm. She'll advertise it with her dance. And then she'll go back to the site. But after a while, she, she just goes, she doesn't, she stops going back to the site. She stops spending time at the site. And when she comes back to the swarm, she doesn't even dance for it. It's like she says, it's, like she, it's almost as if she said to herself, okay, I've made my contribution to the debate. I'm going to pass it on to the next generation. Um, I'm going to let, I've done my thing. I've, I've made my assessment. I've made my vote. I've expressed my opinion. But now I'm going to go quiet. I'll let, I'll let the next generation of scout bees um, take the process forward. And so that... By the, and that's, what we, that's all we thought the process was for losing interest for many, many years. But in the summer of 2010, I, I asked myself, hmm, is that the full story? Or is there some sort of encouragement of these bees to give up on a site? Is there some kind of negative campaigning? The Waggle Dance is clearly a positive campaign, and it's saying, come on to my site, come on to my site. But is there some negative process going on as well? And in the summer of 2010, I discovered that there is. And it's a, it's a new signal. It's a kind of negative campaigning. And um, the way it works is the following. I'll show you how the signal works, what it looks like. It's a signal 
while the bee is doing a waggle dance to advertise her site, and she's you know, really promoting her site, every once in a while, a bee from another site will come over to her and ram her with her head, headbutt against the bee, the dancing bee. And when she's headbutting against her, she's making a little sound. It's a very faint sound. It, that's why I didn't know about it. You actually have to hold a microphone, a small microphone, right by the dancing bee to know if she's getting hit by one of these other bees. We call this the stop signal or the beep signal. We call it the beep signal because it's, it's a short thing. It's only about each hit, each headbutt is about 150 milliseconds long. There's a little sound associated with it. The bee that's doing the budding, she, she activates her flight muscles, her wing muscles, so she makes a sound. And that's probably emphasizing that this isn't just an incidental bump buster. You're actually being told to stop dancing. And any one beep doesn't shut off a dancer cold, but it's a dose of inhibition. And after a dancer gets hit with about 10 of those, she will stop dancing. What does it look like? Well, I'm going to show you a movie here. What we're going to see is this little bee here with the blue and yellow paint mark on her thorax. She's going to be merrily dancing along. And another bee with a pink paint mark from a different nest site, different nest box on the island, is going to come over and hit her three times. Beep her three times. Oops. Hold on. Got to get the microphone down there. Let's redo this. Could you hear that beep at all? A little bit? I'll do it one more time. I, I could, I'll try to Here she comes. First. Second. Third. So that, that's the, uh, that's that signal. And it, as I say, it's a cross inhibition signal. And it, it sharpens up their decision making because the winning site not only gets ahead by virtue of st stimulation but also stronger inhibition. So what's this right organization to wrap things up that makes a democratic group remarkably intelligent? Uh, what is the right organization? Well, I, I'll share with you what I've learned from the bees and I'll, but I'll put out these caveats. This works really well for groups in which the members have a unity of purpose. And it's where the individuals differ in their information, but not in their preferences. And uh, that might seem very special. Um, uh, it's not going to, it's, it doesn't work. These things don't work where the, uh, you've got bedrock differences in the preferences of the individuals in the group. But a lot of times humans might come into a group and sometimes even in a faculty meeting where they, they do have a unity of purpose. They want to hire the best person. They might have differences in, uh, in some parts of their preferences, but deep down they would like to hire the best person. But they might have different pieces of information about that decision. So what are the bees doing to, to do it right? Well, these are the things that I extract and try to apply. First of all, credits, if you can create a situation where the group members share a decision-making goal or you stress that or you remind that among the members of the group, for example, we do want to hire the best person or we want to best allocate these resources. Secondly, try to uh, create a situation where the group members possess diverse knowledge. If you're assembling a committee, do as the scout bees do. Have, try to get individuals that have gone out, can bring in di different pieces of information, diverse information. Set up a situation where the individuals feel free to share their knowledge. Uh, this might be involved saying, well, okay, let's go around the room and see what people are thinking about this. I want to hear what everybody is saying. And that certainly that go goes on with the scout bees. They can come back. If they find something, they can freely report it where they're dancing. Then have the group members express their judgments, express their votes uh, independently. And this might involve a secret ballot rather than raising hands so nobody feels peer pressure. And then finally, uh, let the uh, aggregate these votes, the members' votes, in a fair way. Uh, in the case of the bees, it's one vote per bee. Uh, each bee can, has the same weight. 
and they look at it as a quorum sensing process. Whichever site wins, reaches the quorum, the threshold level of evidence first is the winner. Of course, we often do uh, majority votes or, or and so forth. So these are, these are the things I've learned from the bees and uh, ask Howie if, that, if he thinks those actually worked in our, in our uh, faculty meetings. Uh, my, I have to say my colleagues, I didn't tell everybody at first that I was doing this, but uh, they were amused to find out bees were inspiring them. And I see our current chairman sometimes says, well, when we get into a sticky situation, I'll say, well, Tom, what would the bees do? And, uh, and I will share with him what, what I would say. Sometimes it's just a matter of, well, we need to argue some more. <laughs> and uh, I'm not the only person to claim that there's wisdom to be gained from the bees. You can see William Shakespeare uh, grasped this back in 1599 as well. Well, thank you very much, folks, for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, story of the bees. You're welcome. This is, this is just a token. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you but very anyway, much, Helen. Great. Great. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody, for attending the meeting. Thank you all for attending. Thank you.